I'm going to try something new today. I'm, this is my first time ever, I'm coming into the 21st century, of doing a PowerPoint. I've never done it before, but I, I can't stay over there and do this, so I'm sorry. It'll be different than most of your PowerPoints. Um, comedy. Um, comedy... Comedy is very personal, and you need to remember that. It's, it's, it's very personal. Uh, it's, it's, it's about the individual. I, I, sometimes I'll, I'll talk to people about movies or, or a play or something that I saw that I thought was funny or that I hated. And it's fun because you talk to friends and then they have the exact opposite reaction. You know, I liked it. I thought it was really funny. Oh man, I didn't, I didn't get any of it. I thought it sucked. That's not unusual. Because comedy is personal. Two things have to happen for something to be funny. One, you have to understand what's going on. If you don't understand what's going on, it's not going to be funny. They sound like test questions, don't they? What two things you need to have them to be funny. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds like a good test question. And two, detachment is necessary. One, you have to understand it, but there has to be detachment. In other words, it can't be too close to you. If it's too close to you, it'll probably not be funny. So I have to understand it, but it can't be too close. And I'll give you an example of that. If, say, we were out in the wintertime and there was ice out here and or maybe you're at your house and you look out your window and there's a, an old man that lives up the street from you who's really mean and he, he likes to kick your, your cat and, and he's always complaining about you and he throws crap in your yard and he, and he hates your family, says nasty things and he comes out of his house and it's cold and there's ice out there but he doesn't know that there's ice out there and he's walking along and he's just being his miserable self and he sees your cat and he goes to kick it and his feet fly up and he falls on his butt and farts. <laughs> would you laugh? Yeah. Most of us would. Most of us would. But Say it were your sick grandmother, who you love dearly, and she'd been very ill, and she comes out of the house for the first time in a long time, she's been real sick, and she slides and falls on the ice. Would you laugh? Some of you would. <laughs> Most people wouldn't. Not until you find out she was okay. Then you'd laugh about it. See what I'm getting at? I've got to understand, we all understand sliding on ice and falling. We understand that. That's, that's pretty universal. What we don't want is it to be too close to us. It's okay if it's happening to somebody else. As long as it's not happening to me. It's too close. Does that make sense? Comedy also has a surprise factor to it. It usually works if we're not expecting it to happen. It catches us off guard. We're surprised by it, then we find it funny. If you're expecting it, sometimes it's not as funny. Okay, um, to be funny, two things must happen. Understand what's going on, detachment is necessary. Any thoughts or questions about that? Okay, I'm gonna go back and we're gonna go through theater history and we're going to talk about different kinds of comedy and, and the origins of comedy in the theater.
Okay? Next slide, please. Comedy in theater, in, in the Western theater, we can trace back pretty easily. And the beginnings of, of comedy as we know it begins in ancient Greece with what were called the satyr plays. This is a, from an um, urn, a painting of a satyr play. You guys know who the satyrs are? Half goat, half men. Here's a satyr, got his little tail sticking out, and uh, satyrs in the satyr plays, were, they were very horny. They were, always chasing after the they were always chasing after nymphs, that's right. If you saw the cartoon Hercules, oh. Phil is a satyr and he's chasing the nymphs in the very beginning. Um, sometimes in the satyr plays, the, satyr, the character playing the satyr, this whole bottom part would be covered with woolly leggings to make them look like they're more like a goat. But in this one, he's not. But the nymph is letting him have it. She's hitting him with a stick where it hurts. People would have found that funny in ancient Greece. That's basically what the satyr plays were. In ancient Greece, if we go back and look at the culture, what was important to them was that there would be procreation. They had to keep their city-state going. Having lots of children was extremely important. Lots of kids would die young. So having lots of children. So to be fertile was really, really important. And in the Seder plays, they were pretty much real sexual. And believe it or not, it comes out of their religion, out of this need to procreate. So you have the satyrs chasing the nymphs around, and then usually the nymphs beat them up. It's pretty much how they all ended. Um, as time goes by in ancient Greece, there are real plays written, full-length plays written, that are comedies. And the most famous writer of these full-length plays is this guy, Aristophanes. A-R-I-S-T-O-P-H-A-N-E-S. -E Aristophanes. Aristophanes lived between 448 B.C. and 388 B.C. Time goes backwards in B.C. So, Aristophanes wrote a number of plays that still survive and are still produced. They're quite funny. Some of them are a little hard to understand because he made a lot of fun of people living in that day and time. And if you don't know who he's making fun of, some of his plays aren't very funny. Um, but one of the plays, and we just did it here not too long ago, that's extremely funny and gets produced a lot is his play Lysistrata. L-Y-S-I-S-T-R-A-T-A. -S Lysistrata. Lysistrata. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Lysistrata and uh, see if you find it funny. In Lysistrata, um, we have takes place in ancient Greece, as, as I said, and there's a war going on. There's a war between the Spartans and the Athenians. It was an actual war in that day and time, the, the Peloponnesian Wars, where Sparta and Gre uh, Athens fought one another for control of Greece. And it was a long war. It lasted many, many years. And one of the people who did not like this war, who thought it was unnecessary, and who protested against it with his plays was Aristophanes. And he wrote several plays that had to do with trying to end war. And that's Lysistrata is one of them. In Lysistrata, the play begins and there's a group of women. And the leader of the women is the woman Lysistrata. And Lysistrata gets her friends together and she says, look, I've called a meeting of all the women from all over Greece. 
Spartan women are coming. The other city states are sending representatives. And here's what I want to have happen. These men don't know how to run our country. We're going bankrupt. We're fighting wars. Our children are going off and dying. It's not fair. Let's end the war. And the women all go, yay, but how are we going to do it? I thought about that. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a sex strike. No one can make love to their husband or boyfriend until the war ends. And the women go, no, we don't want part of that. They all start to leave. She rallies them back again. They finally sign a, a contract. They agree. None of them are going to have sex until the war ends. And the women said, well, how are we going to do this? How, how are we going to make sure that nobody cheats on this? She says, well, I'm going to lock, we're all going to lock ourselves up in the temple of Athena. And we'll barricade the doors and we're not going to let any men in. And until they agree to end the war. So they attack the temple of Athena. There are some police guards who come out to try to stop them. They beat up the policemen. It's, it's very physical comedy. They beat up the policemen. They take over and they wait. The mayor comes, the mayor of Athens. He shows up, says, you know, you stupid women, get out of here. You don't know anything about politics. How dare you think you can tell us men what to do? We like to fight. And by the way, the treasury is locked up in there and I need that money. They go, can't have it. So they end up beating him up. And they dress him up as a woman. Send him off. Well, time goes by. And we start seeing, Lysistrata comes out and tells the audience, says, you know, the women are getting a little weak in here. I'm afraid some of them are going to try to sneak out. And there's some real funny scenes of different women trying to sneak off to go see their husbands. But they keep them in. And finally, one of the key generals, a guy named Kinesius, I'm not going to ask you this on the test, Kinesius, who's the head general, shows up. And his wife, Marini, is, is there with, with Lysistrata. And he shows up with, his, with a child. And he says, Marini, come out. I got the baby here. You know how to take care of the baby. I don't know how to change the diapers. It's been weeks. She's going, oh, poor dear. I'll be right out. Let's start to grab her and says, tease him. You tease him, but don't give in. Yes, ma'am. She goes out. And he goes, he starts doing all kinds of stuff. He says, honey. I know you love me. I love you. Will you end the war? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I'll end the war. I'll, I'll end the war and uh, let's go to bed. She goes, okay. And it, he starts ripping his stuff off. She goes, wait a minute. I got to have a bed first. You got to have a bed. Yeah, I got to have a bed. He runs off, comes dragging a bed in, puts it down. He jumps in the bed. I'm ready. She goes, oh, I can't do it without pillows. He runs off and he gets the pillows, puts them in. I'm ready. You smell. I need perfume. He runs off, comes back with perfume. She sprays it all over him. And he has to go get about three more things. Finally, he goes, she goes, you will end the war, won't you? And his answer is, I'll think about it. And he jumps up to jump on top of her. She rolls away. He crashes on it. And he's left in agony. She runs back into the temple. Now, that's one of the things. Because of this period, all the characters, and they did it in the Seder plays, too, they, they wore what are called phalluses. I'm not going to ask you this on a test. But the phallus represented it. And when he shows up, it's like, it's like 
like a baseball bat. And he's walking around. And then all the other men show up, all the Senate and everybody, and they all got him. And they're all standing there. And there's even a scene where the two, two of them sword fight each other with their phalluses. It's real sexual. Finally, what, what happens? They give in. The men give in. The, the, the Spartans show up. The Athenians show up. They come to an agreement. They go off and sign a peace treaty. And then the last scene of the play, which is pretty typical for these Greek comedies, they have a big song and dance number. And they're all drinking and partying. They got wine. Aristophanes was even famous... Uh, a lot of his plays end with the characters going out into the audience going, here, have some wine. Vote for us. They did this as a competition. Vote for our play. <laughs> and they'd give, they'd give the audience wine as a bribe to try to, so he could win the competition. But that's typical of the Greek comedies. They were sexual, um, quite often very political. Uh, in some of his plays, Aristophanes calls out people who would have been in the audience. He names them and talks about, you know, what a crooked politician they are. And it's part of the freedom that they had in Athens. Athens had, had pure freedom of speech. They could say anything about anybody. And they did. And he does in the plays. But this play is pretty popular. It still plays today. And um, if you ever saw it, I think you would like it. It's, it's very, very, very funny. Now, they don't come out naked or anything, but they do have the phalluses. They're fake. They're not, they're not real. They're fake. And they usually look like sticks or something. So, any questions about that? Everybody's going, this is Strata. All right. Cool. Next slide. I'm ready to jump ahead. What I want to talk about now is the Commedia dell'arte. Let's, let's uh, try it without the light. Is, or can you guys see it? Can you see it okay? You nodding your head? Yeah, cool. The Commedia dell'arte is also called the Italian comedy. It was popular in Italy throughout the 16th century. Basically what happened with the Commedia dell'arte is troops of performers, there would be a gang, a group of performers, and they would form a troupe, and they toured, they traveled all over Europe. And they would stop at a little town, they would set up a small stage, they usually had a wagon that they kept all their props in, they'd set up a little stage, and then they would perform for the town. And once they performed, then they'd go on to an, another town and perform. Um, it remained really popular, uh, th like I said, throughout the 16th century, throughout the 1500s. And it's still with us today. There are Commedia dell'arte troops that still perform around the world. What's important about the Commedia dell'arte is it established character types that are still with us today. Established character types that are still with us today. Let me see the next slide. Thanks. Okay, the main character was a servant character called Harlequin. Probably read his novels. Harlequin was a servant. He wore patches on his costume, and each patch represented one of the other characters. So he had, had pieces of everybody's costume patched on his costume, and that was traditional. He wore a half mask, just a, a mask that just covers up here, and he carried a slapstick. I have my slapstick here. It's broken, though. The slapstick, if you can see here, it has a hinge on it. 
and it's two boards, one's hooked on a hinge. So when you go back with it, the back board flies back. And then when you go forward to hit somebody, it slaps, making the nap. Remember we talked about naps? So I don't actually have to hit somebody. I can stop short and it'll make a loud nap. And Harlequin would carry his slapstick around with him and it would become all kinds of things. He'd make it into a sword. He would make it a guitar. He would make it into a gun. Uh, it, you know, it would be just about anything he wanted it to be. But from time to time, he used it to whack people. He would slap people with his slapstick. It's from that that we get the word slapstick comedy. <coughs> slapstick comedy is what kind of comedy? Physical comedy, where people hit each other, trip, fall down. Slapstick comedy. It comes from Harlequin and carrying the slapstick. As I said, he was a servant character. He usually worked in all these comedies. What these comedy troops would do, it was improvisation. They would not really have a written script. They would go out, much as improv troops do now, they would have a basic scenario and then they would just play it out depending on how the audience reacted to it. Um, later on, uh, there's a playwright named Moliere who would write down a lot of these scripts. Uh, but it, it, when they first performed them, they were not written down. They were just improvised. But the characters never changed. Every Commedia troupe would have a Harlequin. And the Harlequin would be the lead character. The story would revolve around Harlequin. Usually Harlequin worked for a miser, and that miser wouldn't treat him very well. And usually the story would be Harlequin would outsmart him in the end. And he, Harlequin always wins. Let me see what the next slide is. I don't know what it is. Ah! Here's another picture of a different Harlequin. You can see the patches a little better here. And this is a woman character called Columbina. Columbina was the female version of Harlequin. More than likely, Harlequin was going to be in the story, but if he wasn't, it would be about Columbina. A lot of times, Columbina would be Harlequin's love interest and would help him. If Columbina was in the story, she's smarter than Harlequin. But she would let him think he was smarter than her. And a lot of times she would be the one who would solve the problem and then give him the credit for it. Columbina. See the next one. All right, I said he had a, a master. He had a, a boss, a master. Um, he was a servant character. One of the key masters that you would see, uh, there, they had different names. There was Garante and, and, and some others. But the most famous was Pantaloon. And Pantaloon was named because his pants only came to his knees. Thus he wore pantaloons. Ha, 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 ha. That's where that came from. Pantaloon was a miser. He was very rich, but he would always pretend that he was poor. He would always pretend that he didn't have any money. He would be mean to Harlequin. And again, Harlequin would outsmart him in the end. If he had children, quite often he was trying to marry off his kids to someone. And that would be the story. Harlequin, a lot of times, would have to help the children get out of trouble. Save them. Pantalone, um, a lot of times would have a big nose. This is pretty small for Pantalone. Sometimes his, they all wore these half masks, but his ma sometimes his nose would be just like huge. Uh, it just depended on the mask and how it was made. Let's see the next one. One of the other main characters was the captain, or Capitano. The captain was a military figure, or at least he pretended to be a military figure. Sometimes he wasn't. 
He would pretend to be brave, but actually he was a coward. And he would put on airs. The captain usually carried a sword or some sort of weapon. Later on, he might have a whole brace full of weapons. Again, to try to make himself look like he was more of a warrior than he really was. Some of the bits that were done with him, I, I like the captain's character because, you know, what would happen is uh, the captain would come up and he would go, Harlequin, there's a bear in that cave and we must get him out. Now, I being a military genius, I'll use my military mind and will destroy that bear. So, you go first and I'll stay back here where it's dangerous. And he would, he would pull stuff like that. Uh, in one of the plays he talks about, somebody says, but you ran away. And he goes, how dare you say I ran away? I attacked in the other direction. You know, he would tell jokes like that. He would never admit that he was not brave. He pretended to be all the time. Okay, let's see the next one. The doctor, or doctore, know him as the doctor. The doctor was either a PhD or a medical doctor. He dressed in black, which was common for that time period. Again, we see the half mask. The doctor is a pretty crazy character. The doctor would speak in big words, sometimes in Latin, quite often in Latin. But if you knew Latin, it's not real Latin. It was made up words. And he would try to show off his intelligence. He would try to make people think he was smarter than he was. If he was a medical doctor, more than likely if you were his, his patient, you would die. Or he'd make you sicker. And then blame it on something else. One of the things that was used a lot in these comedies were enemas. He was always giving people enemas. That would be his prescription. Somebody would go, I have a headache. You need an enema. It cures everything. Uh, and they thought that was real funny in the, in the 1500s. Um, but he would say stuff like, oh, oh, you, you, you're feeling bad, young lady. Oh, let me check. Oh, yes, the epidermis of the escula is uh, sticking out the patuki of the dingling. Uh, it looks like we could suffer a severe case of paratononide, <laughs> but you'll survive. Here, have an enema. I mean, he used real ridiculous words, real strange words. And he never solved the problem. Let's see another one. I like this guy, Brigalia. Brigalia is another servant character. He was very dumb, extremely dumb. But what was funny about him, sometimes Harlequin would go to Brigalia for information, even though Harlequin was a lot smarter than he was. He would never admit that Brigalia was stupid. Sometimes he played an instrument. They, they, did, they played a lot of music in these things. Um, he was a glutton. He ate a lot. So he was usually big. And he was very lazy. He would seldom do his work and he would slough it off on Harlequin. And then Harlequin would have to do it. Um, he's a fun, funny character. Do I have another one on here? Ah, good. Now, in all these comedies, there were lovers. The lovers were the young people, usually the children of Pantaloon or Garante or one of the other father figures. Um, I think this is an interesting story. This is a painting of an actual actress from the time and her name was Isabella Andrini. Isabella Andrini was so famous 
playing a lover. People, people just loved her performances. She got very, very famous. And what they did, all the Commedia troops after she passed away began to name the, the girl lover in the story Isabella. And so you'll see in a lot of these scripts there'll be an Isabella. Well, that's because she was named after Isabella Andrini. The lovers don't do much. Their main job is to be pretty. They were pretty helpless. They were, they were rich. They were spoiled. And their father usually was really uh, mean to them, didn't understand them. And in the end, they would have to go to Harlequin or Columbina for help. And that would save them. Um, I said they use music. A lot of times the lovers sing too. Except unlike, unlike our servant character, they actually sang well. Sometimes he, he didn't sing well. Depending on the story. Okay, I think that's all. Let me see, is there one more? Yeah, I'll come to this in a minute. We can go ahead and turn that off. Okay. Okay. These characters are still with us. Hardly a comedy out there gets written that you don't see these characters in it. Let me throw one at you. He lives in a pineapple under the sea. Thank you. SpongeBob SquarePants. SpongeBob. Huh? He's Harlequin. Servant character. Not very bright, but he's smarter than his boss. And who wins in the end? SpongeBob always wins. SpongeBob never loses. And he's weird. <laughs> <laughs> SpongeBob. All right. SpongeBob works for a miser. Mr. Krabs. What does Mr. Krabs love? Money, 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 money. That's all you ever hear him talk about. We got to make more money. Up the price of the Krabby Patties. <laughs> The stories may change. He even has a daughter, the young lover. Pearl, the whale. Well, I don't understand that one. <laughs> Crab, whale. No one said any of these stories had to make sense. They're just funny. His best friend's a star, and he practically has a relationship with a squirrel. Yes. We're going to get to those. Okay. So, we got Mr. Krabs. We've got his, the young lover. Does Pearl ever solve any problems? She's, she's worthless. Huh? What does she do all the time? She cries. That's her bit. These characters would all have what was called a bit, and they would do it in every show. No matter what story they were doing, they would work their bit into it. And Pearl's bit is, she cries. She cries real loud. And water shoots and knocks people down. And they make a big deal out of that. Who has to save her? Does Mr. Krabs ever save her? No, SpongeBob does. See, the servant has to go back to the servant. Okay. Now, in SpongeBob SquarePants, there is a servant character who's very lazy, very fat, and he's stupider than SpongeBob, but SpongeBob goes to him for advice. Patrick. Patrick Star. Patrick the Starfish. He's worthless. But I love it. Instead of going to somebody with brains, who does SpongeBob go to for help? Patrick, do you know how to build a rocket ship? Oh, yeah, SpongeBob. <laughs> Let me stand up. Uh, and he sits and drools. That's his bit. He just drools. Uh, and, and one of them, SpongeBob says, no one can do nothing better than Patrick. <laughs> he just stands in. Okay. 
In SpongeBob SquarePants, there's a character who thinks he knows everything, that he's better than everybody, but he actually is not very bright or better than anyone. Squidward. That's the captain. He's the captain character. Well, he goes back and forth. I'm going to get to the doctor in a minute. So we could change it up, but often he's the captain because he doesn't really, he's not really good at anything. He just pretends he is. But there is somebody who supposedly is really smart, who builds inventions all the time, but usually they don't work. Sandy Squirrel. Sandy Cheeks. She lives down under the sea in her little dome. She builds inventions. How often do they turn SpongeBob into something weird? They're, they're not good. She is the doctor character, usually. Usually. Have I left anybody out? Doctor? Huh? Plankton is another father character. Um, and he usually, if he's in the story, he, he's, he's the captain. <coughs> or he's the doctor. He switches back and forth. Depends on, on the story. Depends on what he is. See how that works? They're with us. They're with us in a lot of, a lot of TV shows. They're with us in a lot of movies. Any of you watched any of the, the, the uh, Medea movies? Are these characters in the Medea movies? Think about it. Who is Medea? She's Harlequin. He, she. She's Harlequin. And she's surrounded by a bunch of crazy people. Right? Um, remember the Jeffersons? That was one of my favorite shows when I was young. The Jeffersons, all these characters are in that. All of them. So I know what some of you guys watch. You watch iCarly. <laughs> Admit it. I know some of your bronies too. You watch iCarly? Any of you ever watched iCarly? Thank you. Yeah. These characters are in that too. Who's the, who's the servant character that wins out in the end? Show's named after. It's, it's Carly. And then she's got the friend, and she's got all, all, these other, all the other characters are in there. But you'll see these people in comedy after comedy after comedy. They'll be there. They, they appear again and again and again. And I'm amazed when I'm watching stuff how often we haven't really changed at all. Since the, since the 1500s, these same comic characters are with us. You'll see them in cartoons, and you'll see them in live action with real actors. Any thoughts or questions about that? Now, what I'm going to do next is we're going to look at comedy from its lowest form to its highest form. I want you to write these down and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to give you examples and explain them, okay? The lowest level of comedy is called obscenity. Obscenity. The next level is physical mishap. 
The next level is plot device. It's sometimes called mistaken identity. Zendite, verbal wit. And now we move into high comedy. Do you remember any of this? Some of it? Yeah. yeah. Inconsisten inconsistency of character. Comedy of ideas. And the highest level of comedy is satire. Okay. The continuum of comedy. Obscenity, physical mishap, plot device or mistaken identity, verbal wit, they all make up farce or low comedy. Then high comedy consists of inconsistency of character, the comedy of ideas, and satire. I'm going to explain them all here in just a moment. Okay? All right, let's lower this now. Unless we want to look at that movie. I'm going to, sh I'm going to lecture, talk about one, and then we'll show a scene. Okay? All right. Okay. The lowest level of comedy is obscenity. Obscenity requires no thought. This is why it's low comedy. The higher we go in the continuum, the more we have to think. Everybody understands obscenity. When I talk about obscenity, what I'm talking about, and some of this I'm not sure is obscene, in, in, but what we're talking about usually are bodily functions, and orifices. Comedy that deals with bodily functions or some orifice or appendage, some hole in the body. O R I F I C E. Orifice. I think I think that's right. I'm faking it. I'm being the doctor on that one. Okay. <laughs> no. I don't know. <laughs> How many of you when you were kids thought Fart noises were funny. Don't lie. Most of you still do. You won't admit it, though. My, my little son, who just turned eight, if somebody walks up to him and goes, <laughs> he thinks that is hilarious. My daughter just learned to do this. Stick the hand in. She'll go up behind her brother. Duval Putin. <laughs> Little kids love yucky stuff. They love this. They like talking about poop. They think poop's funny. Dog poop. <laughs> You look like poop. <laughs> and snot. And boogers. See, orifices. 
They love, they think that stuff is just hilarious. This is why in, in, in back in the 1500s, they thought somebody getting an enema was just obscenity. It requires no thought. The caveman sitting in his cave with his family. We, we, they had to have laughed at that. It requires no thought. The Cro-Magnon went, yeah, sounds like a human. Made you lose your drink. Let's bring that up, if we can. This first clip that you're going to see is from the movie Revenge of the Nerds. And it's a scene where Booger meets Snotty, who becomes his mentor. Was that, was that low humor? <laughs> Do you have to think about it at all? Did you get chunks on you? That's a long burp. It's, it, it, this is it. This is, this is like primo of the lowest level of comedy, obscenity. In the continuum of comedy, and as we talk about farce, farce is only believable in the story it's in. It wouldn't happen in real life. Or God forbid, shouldn't. Okay. Huh? Yeah, and yet. Yeah. Okay. The next scene I want to show you is also a, a short scene of obscenity. And it's, it's from a film by one of the great comedy filmmakers, um, Mel Brooks. And it's from his movie Blazing Saddles. In Blazing Saddles, he did a parody of life as cowboys. And there's a scene in there, if you've ever watched a lot of old cowboy movies, what do the cowboys always eat? Chili or, Chili or beans. They're always eating beans. And Mel Brooks said, well, if all you lived on were beans, this is what life on the trail might be like. Blazing Saddles, the famous bean scene. You know what's funny about that? When they first put Blazing Saddles on national TV, can, can I just have some lights so they can, if you'll hit the lights for me. When they first put Blazing Saddles on national TV, they were told that it was too dirty for television. The farting. You couldn't have farts on TV. And you know how they often will put things in a movie, dub over, add work, change language and everything. They changed all, almost all the language in this. Because this gets pretty raunchy at times. They had to do something about the fart scene. So they took out the noise of the farts and they had burp sounds. So these guys go, <laughs> I thought that was a lot more obscene than if we had just done what was in real life. They burp, they burp, everyone was, they were just burping. And then finally someone went, that's really stupid. And then it came back, and they put it on TV and they put the farts back in it, which, you know, Kids know what a fart is. It just, it's just there. That's the lowest form of comedy. Any thoughts or questions about that? Okay. The second lowest form of comedy, the next level of farce, is physical mishap. Physical mishap is also called slapstick comedy. Physical mishap or slapstick comedy. In physical mishap, characters get hit, Kicked, fall down, slide, get their eyes poked, get smashed. It's all about physical comedy. 
Now, what makes it work is if the audience believes the actor got hurt while doing it, it won't be funny. Unless it's, uh, uh, what's that, ja the Jackass show? You know what I'm talking about? We kind of like that those guys get hurt. But in most comedies, we don't want the actor to get hurt. We want the character to get hit on the head and then there'll be a reaction that's funny, that's not real. So when Curly gets poked in the eye, he never screams and we see blood pouring out of his eye. That doesn't happen. Now where they've gotten away with that is in some animation. But again, they're animated characters, so they can. So um, on uh, Bart Simpson, when they watch um, the little cat and the mouse that kill each other all the time. What, what? Itchy, and Itchy and scratchy. And they're bleeding all over the place. We'll handle that because it's a cartoon. And if I had a real mouse out there and a real cat and they were cutting them up, that probably wouldn't go over too well. Okay. All right. One of the greatest of this style of comedy was a comedy group in the 19th, they started in the 1930s and they continued until the 1960s and it was the Three Stooges. The Three Stooges started out in what was called Vaudeville Theater and they worked for a guy named, I'm not going to ask you this on a test, they worked for a guy named Ted Healy who turned out to be an alcoholic and not very funny and everybody laughed at them. They were funny. He was not, even though he was the star of the show. And eventually, they just replaced him, and they kept the name The Stooges. It was called Ted Healy and The Stooges. They kept the name The Three Stooges. They would change personnel. Uh, it started out, uh, there was Curly was in it, uh, Curly Howard. Uh, but he, he had a stroke, and then he was replaced with his brother Shemp. And then Shemp was replaced uh, with uh, Curly Joe. And then Curly Joe was replaced by Joe Besser. But they, they continued to do comedy way on into the 1960s. So this is from one of their uh, shorts. This is called Punch Drunks. In this story, we're going to see the very beginning of it. In this story, Mo, the one with the hair hanging down, is a fight um, promoter and he's got some boxers that work for him and they're having lunch and Curly comes in he works at the restaurant I want to start it and go past this first yeah start it was that funny? Of course. how many of you thought it was funny? good good Roseanne Barr once said that, that all real men love the Three Stooges and all real women think they're stupid. I don't know if there's truth to that, but I think they're funny. They make me laugh. But it's all physical comedy. Now, they do throw in other stuff. No one, no one play, no one movie is just one kind of comedy. They're all what's referred to as eclectic. In other words, you'll get the whole shebang types of comedies in any one film. They were doing a lot of puns in there, they were doing a lot of what's verbal wit. Um, that's just part, of, just part of, of doing a play. How am I doing on time? Okay, I got five minutes, great. I, I'm going to show you one more clip. This is a different type of physical comedy. It's from a comic group called Abbott and Costello. You, no, I'm not going to show you who's on first on this one. This is physical comedy, that's verbal wit. Abbott and Costello made a lot of movies. In the 1940s, they were the biggest, highest paid actors in the, in the world. This is one of their great movies. It's a scene from a movie called Buck Privates. B-U-C-K. Buck Privates. And it's about two guys who were con men who get tricked into joining the army. And the scene you're going to see is them in drill. It's a real short scene, but it'll show you a little bit of different kind of physical comedy. Let's start it.
You know, I've, I've liked this clip since I was a kid, but one day I was, I was showing it to an intro class, and I had a guy that had been in the National Guard, and he said that reminded him of his unit. That kind of scared me a little bit. Uh, but how many of you found that funny? A lot more than the other one. It, it's, Abbott and Costello are masters of two kinds of comedy. They're masters of, of verbal wit, which we're going to get to, and they are masters of physical comedy. Uh, and this, I think, is a really good bit. Again, could you do this in the real army? No. It's believable only in the situation, only in the film it's in. Okay? See you next time, guys.